Hello kiddos, we are going to discuss um, the history of evolutionary thought and um, some evidence for evolution today. And I'm sorry I can't be with you in person to discuss this. It's one of my favorite things to talk about in biology. Um, but it's Friday, February 26, 2021. We're going to do lessons 205 and 206. And you do have an assignment today. It's um, called Evolutionary Evidence, February 26. Um, if we had had a polling question, at the beginning of class, we would be um, answering this question. It says the graph shown here represents which type of natural selection, and you can see that dip in the middle means that the average trait. This is this this is the the old um, the old population graph before there was some change in the environment, and it smooshed it down, and you can see that the normal typical average. Um, trait that was most abundant in the population was disrupted to peaks, so we call that um, disruptive uh, natural selection, letter B. So let's keep going here. Um, we are going to talk about how Darwin wasn't actually the first, um, Charles Darwin wasn't the first person to think of things um, in an evolutionary way, uh, Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de Monet de Lamarck, um, that's seriously his name, uh, decided or learned early on, observed early on, that individuals could acquire traits that might be passed to offspring. Georges Cuvier compared mammoth fossils with bones of modern elements and realized that they were similar not the same, yet distinct, right? Very similar though, suggesting that there were species in the past that had died out, which suggested that the earth was far older than many scientists had imagined. In the 1830s, Charles Lyell proposed that changes in the surface of the earth accumulate gradually over long periods of time. Uniformitarianism, there's a word, right? Uh, means that the same processes occurring in nature today also took place in the past. So we recognize today evidence for evolution. And so if we then can, you know, the theoretically, logically say, well, you know, if these processes are occurring today, they must have occurred in the past as well. And even Charles Darwin's grandfather influenced his ideas. So Charles Darwin, who you saw a picture of on the first slide um, was not the first person to have ideas of you know of evolution but anyway let's talk about Charles Darwin um, Charles Darwin was born in 1809 in Shrewsbury England he was the second youngest of six children he came from a wealthy family um, and his family was you know he came from a long line of scientists and his mother Susanna died when he was only eight years old. His father was a doctor and his grandfather was a botanist, which is someone who studies who studies plants. Um, he was educated at the University of Edinburgh at 16. He went to college in 1825. In 1827, two years later, he um, switched to what's called Christ's College in Cambridge. So Edinburgh is way up here and here's Cambridge way down here. Um, close to London, and he studied natural history. Um, the HMS Beagle, that is Darwin's ship. Darwin um, went on a five-year survey trip around the world. The ship was captained by Robert Fitzroy. Uh, it launched in 1831. Darwin collected natural specimens of birds, plants, and fossils. He sailed around the world, um, but South America and the Galapagos Islands were of particular interest to Darwin. Observations made there in the Galapagos Islands uh, shaped Darwin's ideas on evolution and natural selection. This is right out of your lesson. Darwin's theory of evolution declared that species survived through a process called natural selection where those that successfully adapted or evolved to meet the changing requirements of their natural habitat thrived and reproduced, adapt or die, right? While those species that failed to evolve and reproduce died off. So after um, Charles Darwin finished college, he had an opportunity to go on this trip and study, um, you know, the natural specimens of all these places that this ship was going to go visit. Um, and so that's where he got his ideas and his evidence for um, 
natural selection and evolution. So he started in England, sailed across the Atlantic, down around the tip of South America, stopped right here at the Galapagos Islands, which, which is off the coast of Ecuador, and then across the Pacific, down around Australia, and ended here um, near Madagascar. I always find this interesting. Since he was constantly seasick aboard the HMS Beagle, Darwin probably enjoyed his brief stay on Mauritius, I think I said that right, island, even though he did little collecting or commenting on what he saw there. So yeah, he sailed around the world, but he was seasick the whole time, which must have been awful. Okay, so here are the Galapagos Islands. This is South America. Here's Brazil, Chile, Peru, and the Galapagos Islands right here are off the coast of the country of Ecuador. And um, so here's a blown up, right? Here's the tiny little spot in the ocean in the Pacific Ocean where the Galapagos Islands are. And then over here, this is a picture of the map of all of the Galapagos Islands. Um, so I just wanted you to see where Darwin was when he was doing his work and collecting his evidence, which led to his theory of evolution. And um, these are the Galapagos Islands, and they are off the coast of Ecuador. So Charles Darwin wrote a book called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural selection. And here's the cover of one of the original prints of the book. It was published in November 1859, um, and it gave a detailed explanation of his theory. Now, keep in mind, he made his trip to, um, let's see if I can get back to the slide I wanted to show you. He made his trip, here we go, that's the slide I want, in 1831, right? It took five years, so he got home in 1836, and he didn't publish his book until 1859. So it took him a while to, you know, look at all that evidence he collected while he was in the Galapagos Islands, come up, formulate the theory, write the book. It's a pretty big book. So, you know, science takes time. That's kind of my point here. So after exhaustive study of his data, Darwin proposed that natural selection could lead to changes in species. One of the lasting ideas Darwin proposed is that organisms with helpful traits will live longer and have more offspring than organisms that lack those traits. He called this idea natural selection and suggested that over long periods of time, natural selection could cause populations to change, eventually leading to a change in species. By, compar by comparing existing species with ex extinct species, Darwin also proposed another major idea. Life on Earth today has descended with some changes from shared ancestors. He called this phenomenon descent with modification to explain how current day species have evolved from earlier species. He died in London in 1882. He's buried at Westminster Abbey. And I love this, I found this online. Um, it's just a little quick fact card about Charles Darwin, um, and it says here, obviously, he was a biologist. Um, he lived from 1809 to 1882. He was a naturalist and a biologist, best known for his theory of evolution and the process of natural selection. In 1859, he published his landmark book on the origin of species. He came from a family of scientists. He's known for developing the theory of evolution. Um, he spent five years on the HMS Beagle. He studied botany and zoology in the Galapagos Islands. There's a mountain named after him in Chile, and his quote here is, A man who dares to waste one hour of time has not discovered the value of life. So I found this, this little card um, online. Okay, so um, quick tour through Lesson 206. You do have to read it. Right? This is just kind of the key points, but to get the full picture, you definitely have to read Lessons 205 and 206. So there is scientific evidence supporting the theory of evolution. Um, it comes from three areas called comparative embryology, comparative anatomy, and vestigial structures. Comparative embryology is the study of similarities and differences in the embryos of different organisms. Vertebrate embryos develop in similar ways, suggesting that vertebrates share genes derived from a common ancestor. Vertebrates, right, those are 
animals like us that have backbones. And you can see that at early stages of development, the pig, the cow, the rabbit, and the human, this is an early embryo, they all look very similar. And still in like the middle stages of development, still these embryos look very similar. And it isn't until the later stages of development that they start to differentiate. So that's comparative embryology. Comparative anatomy is the study of similarities and differences in the anatomy of different organisms. Comparative anatomy reveals patterns of commonality between species and their physical structures. Similar structures in different species that are modified from those of a common ancestor are known as homologous structures. So this is a chicken and this is an elephant and yes I know they're not the same size, chickens are much smaller than elephants, but you can compare their anatomy, right? Um, they have a skull, both a chicken and an elephant. Uh, the mandible, the jaw, both have a jaw, the chicken and the elephant. They both have ribs, they both have uh, lumbar vertebrae, they both have a tibia, they both have phalanges. So these um, pieces of anatomy, even though the chicken and the elephant are very different, they have such similar structures that that is evidence that they, um, you know, have commonality between species and their physical structures. And then those similar structures indicate that there was a common ancestor a long time ago. Homologous structures, that note the same bone structure in each forelimb. So penguins, right, have wings, we like to say. Um, alligators have legs and feet and toes. And you can see like the toes here on the penguin, if you were to look at a penguin's bone structure in its wing, it actually has bones. They're called phalanges, like the toes. Same thing in the alligator. Um, the carpal, right? That's like your wrist. You can see it here in the human. Bats have it. Penguins have it. Alligators have it. Okay, so it's the same bone structure. Even though we're very different organisms, we still have homologous structures. So that indicates that long, long time ago, there was some common ancestor that vertebrates descended from. Uh, your humerus is your upper arm bone, right? We have one, alligator has one, penguin has one, bat has one. So there's more evidence for evolution. Vestigial structures are fun to talk about. Vestigial structures are structures that appear to have no function for the organism, but probably had a function in an ancestral organism. Um, our appendix is an example of a vestigial structure. The appendix, that organ, the appendix in our bodies does nothing, um, but it's theorized that, you know, it did many, many hundreds of thousands of years ago in an ancestral organism. And whales actually have hip bones. Um, they don't walk, but they do have you know, homologous structures in their hips that are actually bones, that are hip bones. Um, and so over time, as they moved into the sea and their legs weren't needed of their ancestors, I'm not saying a whale itself, but the ancestor of the whale over time, the, when legs aren't needed, you know, to be streamlined in the ocean, and you can actually see hip bones if you were to dissect a whale. So again, um, that was a quick tour through lessons 205 and 206, highlighting some of the key points. It is imperative that you read lessons 205 and 206 on your own thoroughly. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting read, lessons 205 and 206, especially about vestigial structures. I think you'll find that you'll find that interesting. So your homework is to read 205 and 206 thoroughly and finish um, this assignment today. It's called evolutionary, actually I think it's called evolutionary evidence, not evolutionary thought. So look for evolutionary evidence, February 26. Here, I'll cross that out. Yeah, it's called Evolutionary Evidence, February 26th. Um, check your grade book, catch up on your schoolwork, and have a great weekend. Make sure you get all that done, and I'll see you guys on Monday.